we have Warren Luxon here who's going to give us a talk on the RV. Um, just in the interest of time, I normally would introduce all the wonderful things that Warren does, no, but let's just get into it. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I assume can be heard okay, no major problems. Uh, Vinta, there are a few people coming, but we'll get started anyway. So um, I have no uh, conflict of interest or financial disclosures. Um, outline, I'm gonna quickly cover uh, learning objectives, some recommended readings, um, why I think the break venture flow is somewhat appropriate, um, how I want to think about at least some of this material and kind of the echo kinds of things. Uh, we'll review some RV physiology, how to interpret RV size, uh, spend some time on interventricular interdependence, and of course, uh, common uh, techniques for RV systolic function assessment. So uh, at the end, you should be able to recognize um, our different size and different kinds of basic pathologies as well. Um, we'll talk about interventricular independence. Hopefully people will be able to recognize, again, what is RV volume versus pressure overload looks like. And then of course, systolic function using a number of guideline-based techniques. Uh, we can talk a little bit about how to do some of them or some of the caveats as well. Um, so I would say these are some really good ones. If you're interested in overall re review articles uh, by Haddad is from, I mean, it's over 10 years now, but these were really good articles when they, when they first came out as well. Um, the 2018 uh, AHA update, as well on, on right heart failure is very good. Um, and then of course, there's the European guidelines as, as well from 2018 as, as well. So uh, two, two recent, obviously the European and the North American guidelines, very similar kind of information. Um, for those of you who are interested in perioperative management in particular, uh, this, uh, this article, this series uh, came in anesthesia anal analgesia. Uh, as well. It's the same first author as the circulation paper, Haddad, but um, many of you may know uh, from the Canadian side, right, Claude Toussignon, who's from St. Mike's, and Andre Deneau, uh, who's also a very famous echocardiographer, intensivist as well, uh, based out of uh, Quebec. So, geez. so why the right ventricle, again, implicated in many disease states as well that are common to critical care. So, um, we we can see it quite commonly, sepsis, ischemia, right, left heart failure. So I, I don't know, I don't think I really need to belabor it, but we all know that it's there. And I will say it'll, it's not always kind of first and foremost in, a, in the list, but it's important idea to recognize that it can be implicated in other disease processes that are not necessarily termed right ventricle first. Um, so why is this important? Um, so I think part of it is the right, <coughs> the right heart again. So if you have right heart disease, when you are looking at a left heart pro process, or if you have right heart in your disease process, you're more likely to die or, or get sicker is really what it comes down to, right? So if you have reduced ejection fraction and you have right heart involvement, you have 45% mortality versus, versus without, right? Relative increase. If you have post-operative right heart failure, right, more likely to die, longer ICU stay, right, you need more resource utilization. If you have a bad, you have a lower quality of life afterwards, and then you also have your exercise capacity is, re is reduced as well, right? If you have a PE with right heart failure, increased mortality as well, right? If you have right heart failure with ARDS, increased mortality. So again, the idea is for many of the disease process that we manage in the ICU that you need to look for this. Why? Because it means your patients are sicker if you if you do see it, you know. And how do we manage it from from there? That's a that's okay. about that. So that gets to this. So how do we want to think about this material? I I will say this talk is not just focus. It's not just a whole bunch of echo clips and the other bits. Because I I will say like. If you want to, you can kind of YouTube lots of clips and the other bits. I will say, I think you should think about, is the RV involved in general when you are scanning people as well? And if you find something, is it a, is it a primary problem? Is it primary RV failure or valve failure, right? Or is it secondary to this? Because that tells you maybe your risk order of importance as well. 
or is this an incidental finding as well? Um, I, I would say I'm mindful that I think about this because again, as we suggested earlier, higher morbidity and or mortality. Um, I will cover, cover some basic uh, pathology and physiological principles as well uh, in, in this talk. And we'll talk about them as they relate to the echocardiography uh, as well. Um, I do say that echo helps us see the problems and targets for therapy, even though we don't anticipate it. So it's kind of like one of those things, if you echo people regularly, you'll find stuff that you didn't really think about. And I think that's, help, that's helpful. It helps expand my mind uh, a little bit. You know, it, it, it minimizes those blind spots that I might have. Um, I will also say decisions must be made. So if you see something, what should, could, or must, or must be done? Um, I also think about how much time do I have, and then I also think about what is the greatest threat to life in terms of my rank order of priorities. So I will talk a little bit about some of the therapies that we can do, um, and we can answer specific questions that people may may have as well. I haven't really driven down into a lot of like the therapeutics, like you know what's my trigger for RVAD or like all this kind of craziness, like what do I break out ECLS or those kinds of things. I'm happy to talk about that if people want to from a shock team perspective or something else, but um, I will say this is more like, if I see this on echo, what am I thinking about for interventions as, as well? And then how I might follow with that. Very well. So some basics of the anatomy and physiology. So um, it's really roughly divided into three, into three parts, okay? So there's the inlet, which is obviously like the, um, the tricuspid the tri annulus, right? The papillary muscles, the subalveolar apparatus, the apical trabeculated uh, myocard myocardium, and then the outflow, which is the conus, right? So um, the idea like in my hand here, right? So the thumb would be your RV inflow as well. And then it wraps around, okay? Going out into the base, into the base of my hand and then out through the through the conus, which is very different than the LV, right? Which is like a which is basically like a like an ice cream cone, which is like all like things coming to come in one side and then they go out out the top, right? Whereas this one it very much comes in one direction and goes out the other as as well. Um, <clears throat> the RV is normally thin walled, okay, which is like two to five millimeters. Keep in mind, right? Left ventricle here is normally up to like eleven millimeters thick, we'll say. Why is that important? Because it helps us identify when we do echo something, whether it is acute versus chronic. <coughs> so that thickness, right, just like LV problems, right, LV hypertrophy or otherwise, gives us an idea here. Um, what does this look like? So, well, these are just anatomical cuts as, as well, right? So this is very similar to what you were used to from your apical four chamber, right? But here's your right atrium. Here's, this is part of your inlet. Right, heading down towards your apical trabeculated myocardium, right? All the trabeculations you see here versus the smooth wall endocardium here. But then what you don't see, of course, is the RVOT, the outflow kind of coming along that would normally come out here. Why is that? Because, well, it's a three dimensional structure. So, to give you a better idea, this is what we're talking about, right? So, you have this RV inflow, the patients on the the patient's right side is here, comes in through the tricuspid valve, goes down through, okay, towards the apex and out. And this is really important because it's very hard actually, when you think about echocardiography or our different planes, to capture this whole structure all in, in one go. That if you capture some areas, you're gonna be missing in others and stuff as well. And so what we're doing is we're trying to capture the idea, so unlike the left ventricle, which, you know, you can turn two planes and you can capture most of it, this one you can't, and it makes it a little more challenging. And we'll talk about why that's important in terms of our uh, RV systolic functional assessment when we get to that later. But just so you know, anatomically, the people will talk about the inlet, um, the apex, um, <coughs> and then also the uh, conus. So, any questions so far? So uh, this wireframe model here, again, why is this, this, this wireframe model here really just helps us illustrate the different morphology of the, of the tricuspid valve. So here's your pulmonic valve, here's your tricuspid valve, right? Here's your, here's your, here's your LV, okay? And what you can see is your RV wraps itself 
around, okay, it's kind of like cupping that left ventricle. And what you can see here is as the right ventricle starts to fail, what happens is it dilates, okay? So it gets a lot bigger, okay? And it ends up squashing the left ventricle, okay? So again, this wireframe model is really useful because it helps us illustrate that anatomic relationship between the two, which we'll get to when we talk to this in short axis. But the 3D picture, 3D picture I want you to have in your mind is that, again, here's your left ventricle like this, with the right ventricle wrapping itself around here. <coughs> so, points to consider. Um, the cardiac output of the right heart is consistent with the cardiac output of the left heart, generally speaking, right? It's a system in series. So why is that useful? Because you can do a cardiac output on the left side. Vincent, you know, and Brian have, so have talked about this before, right? How do you do a like VTI, LVOT cardiac output measurements? Why? Because that's a way you can do that for the right side as well. So for example, if you do, if you know your cardiac output's four liters a minute, then you know the right heart is able to do four liters of cardiac output per minute, right? You know the heart rate, therefore you can do the stroke volume, right? And that way you can, you have an idea of how the right and or left heart is doing, right? You may have a lower ejection fraction, but if the heart's able to do an index of 2.5, I'd say that's pretty reasonable. And you have to ask yourself, well, is that something we actually need to do something about? <laughs> um, anatomically, the RV is larger than the LV but has a lower ejection fraction. So the stroke volumes stay roughly about the same, but it has a lower EF because it's larger, okay? Um, you often don't see RV EF necessarily reported because of that 3D structure, right? So you may see surrogates of ejection fraction, okay, which is like this fractional area change or other measurements, but they're not the same as actually measured EF that you might see on a on, for example, um, cardiac MR or an actual 3, 3D echo kind of reconstruction, which you can do, it just, it takes time. Um, so in people with right heart failure, the other physiological principle is this, is cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. And I am mindful that tachycardia becomes increasingly important as stroke volume fails. Um, and so you'll often see us do this in CVICU, right? Which is we end up atrially pacing people, right? Or you add inotropes, all right, or chronotropes essentially, because of the small, as the stroke volume fails, you move your heart rate dependent for your cardiac output, right? Just like children, stiff, non compliant heart, as your right ventricle fails, again, we favor that heart rate. Um, the RV is, as a, as a general principle, feels better with volume overload than pressure overload, okay? And that comes back again to the myocardium. It's not very thick. It's not, it's not nearly as resilient as that left ventricle, which is able to deal with that pressure overload as, as well. But what we'll talk about is the ability to recognize volume or pressure overload to help us guide our management. So what about, what about RV afterload? Um, the right ventricle here deals really poorly with this, okay? What you can see here is the right ventricle, <coughs> um, the right ventricle here, if you increase afterload, there is a fall in the stroke volume, okay? The right ventricle does not deal well with increased pressure, especially if it's in an untrained ventricle. So this is why people with acute pulmonary emboli and right heart failure, this is why they die, right? They don't die of hypoxia, usually speaking, they die of cardiogenic shock or obstructive shock because of the inability of the right heart to overcome the resistance, right? This increase in, in, in afterload. The left ventricle, however, is largely unchanged, right? over a similar 40 millimeter increase in, 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 in pressure. So what does this mean? Well, acute increases in RV failure can be fatal, right? Why? Because the right ventricle can't deal with that pressure. It just basically, as you can tell, just kind of starts to fall off. The other part, however, is 
if you see pulmonary hypertension and the heart is able to generate like 50 or 60, there's probably some degree of chronicity there. Why? Because the heart has managed to adapt. So when you see these really impressive echoes with these guys, like, you know, like, you know, equal systemic kind of like left-sided, right-sided pressures and stuff like that, there's clearly chronicity. There. Why? Because the heart has had time to adapt as well. So why is this important? Because I am mindful that if you see acute, pulmon acute, acute pulmonary hypertension, you'd want to ask, how's the right heart doing? Why? Because under a new heart or a normal heart that is not trained, it's, it's going to be doing pretty poorly in this, this circumstance. Okay, so heart is, right heart is RV afterload, very sensitive. Um, it wouldn't be IC without talking about ventilation as well. Uh, and so this is, this is really important. Okay, um, so where is PVR? So PVR total right here is the lowest at FRC, right? Whereas it increases here as you increase towards total lung capacity, right? But then also as you start to exhale more, right? And you start, and you start to have more age like this, this and the other parts. So where does this put us? Well, that means you should probably use your, try to ventilate someone near FRC, right? So which is really you trying to avoid really large tidal volumes, right? So more cause for like using lung protective kind of lower driving pressures, like lower away from this total lung capacity, more closer towards here, right? Like small ventilation kind of in here. But then also as well for P per FRC kind of management. So make sure you're in this territory as well. And you're trying to avoid, right, this over distension, but also exhaling all the way down into this territory as well. Okay. Um, I will also say very, very briefly as well, there is, there's, a, there's always a bit of a discussion about lung protective ventilation, you know, whether like you allow acidosis, hypoxia, or like those kinds of things in the context of someone with right ventricle dysfunction. Um, and I think that's, that's a very important discussion to recognize that something that you think is going to, if someone is, you must survive to have complications. And again, it's one of those things where if you think someone is acutely dying of right heart, you know, failure, then fine, yes. I might temporarily hyperventilate them or do those other things, you know, and temporarily relieve lung protective ventilation and actually use, for example, if someone was, for example, in RV volume overload, I might actually, depending, I might increase the amount of intrathoracic pressure and use larger tidal volumes to actually limit, right, the amount of venous return, because I think the person's dying from RV volume overload right? To give me time to do the other intervention. It's a temporary thing, right? But I am mindful that you have to make these compromises and there's not probably one answer, okay? But I do think about this physiology is not as there is only one way to ventilate these people, but you must think about the interaction of your ventilation with that heart and the heart-lung interaction. Okay, so again, FRC, think about your how large your tidal volumes are. You may need to increase them at times for the purposes of uh, reducing RV volume overload, but you may also temporarily relieve lung kind of protective ventilation if you think someone's dying acutely of uh, right heart failure. Um, so there's a whole bunch of RV segments. I I say yes, they they exist. There's a lot of them. Um, I don't know. I'm going to put it to you guys that I think you probably need to at least know a few of the words, which I think are, are really important um, as well. People will talk about the RV free wall. Okay. And what is the RV free wall? So which, what you see here is part of the ventricle is there's the septal wall, right? Which is part, which is part of the ventricle that forms the intraventricular septum. That is the RV, that's the septal wall. Okay which again is it's mainly the interventricular septum, which forms the function of the left ventricle really, um, but also part of the left, uh, the right. And then there's the RV free wall, okay? Which is basically the wall that is out, which is outside, okay? So <coughs> when you hear people talk about different anatomical portions, that's what they're referring to. It's either the septum, septal wall, right? Which is between the two, or is the free wall, which is the part that is unopposed, essentially. There's no 
there's no other kind of part of the ventricle there. And then of that RV free wall, quote unquote, you'll often see that there's the inferior aspect, there's the anterior, and there's lateral parts of those wall. Okay. Um, does that make a huge kind of component? Um, under certain circumstances, yes, you could make a case that, you know, again, the, co the coronary, you know, supply matters. So I'm going to talk about it in very specific ones. I, I will say on a general point of care ultrasound kind of thing, not super much in, in, in my opinion. Um, there, are, there are a few things that may matter, at least I think in terms of how we do this. So uh, portions of the right ventricle that are more prone to injury depending, right? So if you have, this is your anterior wall of your right ventricle here, you're more likely to see stuff here. You'll see clot kind of building up. When you do your subcostal views as well, okay, you're looking at the, again, this inferior aspect, right? Because your viewing plane or angle is coming up through here, right? You're coming, you're looking through this plane, okay? And so you will miss other portions as well, okay? Um, when you look at your um, RV inflow outflow, kind of view here, right? Which is, you know, just above your aortic, aortic valve reaching in and through. Again, you're looking at your MPA down into your, uh, into your RPA and your, and your, L, and your LPA here as, as well. So why is this important? Because I think people will talk about different portions of the, R, of the RV and they'll talk about the septal wall and the free wall. The free wall is the part that's just not the septum essentially. And so it's easy to find. Just look for the LV find the interventricular septum, because that's what it's called, right? Between the ventricles, that's your septum, and then your free wall, the other part. And then usually I just separate the anterior and, and the inferior wall of the, of the right ventricle. Um, I will say, yes, you can have wall motion. Yes, you can have some po components that move better than, than others. Um, and again, and that's part of understanding that you're, you're taking in all these different echo views when you're trying to create a an EF or something else as well, right? Because what you're doing when we do a lot of the surrogate markers is we're looking for a specific area, right? Like a tapsy, which is one area, you know, which is how this area is moving to represent something that isn't even shown in this area, which would be something like up here. And that's one of the challenges. Um, you often talk about the RV base as well, or like the basal segments as well. So remember that's that's this portion here, okay? So the base is where the where the leaflets are, right? And the apex here, the pokey end, is um, is out here. So this is the trabeculated apex, right? And then here's your here's your base. So you'll often see this. Um, people say, oh, the base isn't moving well. It can be up here, for example, this section, but the apex is moving okay. And then this is looking out into your RVOT and conus as as well. Okay. So each of these components can move independently as well. But again, I think that's getting pretty advanced in terms of the echo, but just know that there's a septal wall and then that there's a free wall in, in my mind that, that you'll hear people talk about. Um, okay. So this is a concept of the interventricular interdependence. Um, you know, I, I had a much smarter colleague who basically kind of referred this to this like the, you know, when, when mansplaining or like manspreading was a big thing on, on the transit, uh, essentially, right? Like you have, you have this much room on the bus and you have, you know, this, this person next to you who's just taking up way more room than, the, than that's fair. And you, you kind of feel like this left ventricle, this is you, the left ventricle, and here's someone just, you know, spreading their, their legs and just taking up way too much room and you're just getting squashed in the corner. And the problem is you are constrained, right, by the pericardium. So there's only so much room that is available in the pericardium. And what happens is, right, the system is in serial. So as the blood flows into the right ventricle, it, it fills the right ventricle. And then what it does is the LV, when it ejects, right, is a, is a smaller cavity. And so what happens is now that smaller cavity, it cannot expand. Why? Because there's only so much room in the pericardium and it, it is now constrained by, or that, by that right ventricle. It is filled much more. Okay, so this is the idea. This is the problem, is that if you have 
acute RV failure, either from afterload or from volume, what happens is this right ventricle takes up more room and underfills the left ventricle. And that's really important. Why? Because if the LV cannot be filled, you cannot generate LV systolic, right? You cannot generate left-sided flow. You need to have right-side flow forward to get left-sided flow to have a systemic right blood pressure. And that's one of our problems here. So when you see this pathological state of this gigantic right ventricle, you have to ask yourself, well, how is the left side performing? And I use the physiological, I look at, well, what is my left-sided systolic? What are my left-sided pressures? Is there narrow pulse pressure, okay? Is there, is there evidence of shock or end organ hypoperfusion as well, okay? And then again, and that's what I'm looking for the left ventricle. How well filled is it, right? You can do, again, whether you do Simpsons or you do your LVOT, VTI, stroke volume, those kinds of things to look at my LV filling and ejection. Before you move on, Warren, really quickly. Yeah. How can, what, what is the disconnect between, let's say, a cardiac output on the left versus an ejection fraction when you have this physiologic state? Great cut. Thank you, Vince. Um, so Vince, Vince is asking, like, how do how do you how do you how do you reconcile the disconnect between an ejection fraction and, and cardiac output? So ejection fraction is is mathematically it's a number, right? Which is what is your what is your LV fit cavity like volume before when it fills in diastole, and then what is the and what is the end cavity volume at end systole? It actually has no bearing on whether things are going forward, back, left, or right, or even you know dis disappears actually. And so your EF can be very good, but if it's a very small ventricle that's underfilled, it would still be very good, right? You have to take that EF or that ejection fraction into the context of how is the heart actually doing, right? You could have a hundred, you could have like a 70% EF, but if your, L, if your LV end diastolic volume was like, you know, 20 or 30 mils, you'd probably be dead, right? Why? Because most people normally live like an LV end diastolic volume of like 120 mils. So this is one of those things where <coughs> you have to, again, and this is why this talk is not just echo, it's actually about point of care ultrasonography, which is making clinical decisions and how it relates to this. So to answer your question a little more specifically is EF is a, an echo measurement that, that represents how much the LV is basically eject, ejecting as a percentage. But is that actually enough for cardiac or tissue perfusion? Otherwise, that's still a clinical judgment that you have to orient. And, and if the LV looks really small and your EF is still really great, and the person still looks shocked, I would believe the picture, which is the patient is shocked, even though they have a normal EF. They can have a low stroke volume, low cardiac output, even despite a normal EF. So EF doesn't tell you necessarily anything that's going on. You can still have a shock state from an LV EF. That's really good, even hyperdynamic, let's say. That is correct. So. And that's probably what will happen in most of these cases. Is yeah. You'll actually have a hyperdynamic left ventricle, but the reason the LV is is not doing well, but again, not doing well, quote unquote, is because it is underfilled. It's because it doesn't have enough volume being pushed through from that from that right side. Okay, and then our management is based on changing that right side to improve LV <laughs> filling. Um. So when I when I first started, it it used people used to say, "Oh, the right heart is is passive." Okay, that it. it Basically, you can just give fluid because it's a passive chamber as a conduit to the LV. Um, I, I really want to say, I think people have moved beyond that as, as well. But again, look at those guidelines, right? The right heart like and right heart failure guidelines are just like three years old. So and if everyone here knows like knowledge translation is not exactly a strong point. And and so it's it's actually really important to say, like you'll still hear people talk about that. Like, Oh yeah, give just the CVP is only 15. Just keep giving volume. You know, it'll push it over to the left side. But no, please don't do that. Okay. Um, so I want to say if you have right heart failure, you can give some fluids. I, I I do, I would say it's reasonable. Why? Because I don't think echo is sensitive enough to tell me that there isn't some free load capacity of the of the right heart, especially considering the limited views. Okay. So give a small test, give 250 mils, you know, and watch what happens. Does the LV systolic function get better? Or alternatively, if I see echo, I would ask myself, 
Does the ventricular septum change? Do my loading positions change, right? Does the LV, LV cavity actually get better, right? Does my pulse pressure get better? Oh, wait, no, the right heart gets even bigger. Okay, then I would stop and I would not give any more fluids. Okay. What is the one patient population for the guys in the room whereby you don't want to give more volume and that whole spontaneous physiology about just loading the right heart is not at play? Like you can't, do not pass go, do not give more fluid. What patient population do you think that you can't just overload the RV with fluid? CHF, good thought. What side though specifically? Yeah, and then, yeah, anybody who has any pulmonary hypertension, think about like you're putting a whole bunch of volume on the right side, but it has to fight that pulmonary hypertension. Where is it going to go? It's just going to make that free wall dilate, right? And it's not going to go to the left side, like the left side that you think it will, right? So like you can only volume uh, challenge somebody to give them lots of volume in the right patient, and the right patient is not the patient with massive pulmonary hypertension, right? Because where is that pressure going to go? It's just going to go back to the RV. It's not going to make it through the pulmonary circulation necessarily. Yeah, like I think of the, like you're trying to visualize what is the Frank Starling position of that right heart, mm -hmm. right? Um, is it possible that some more volume might help recruit things? It is possible. But if, if the ventricle is looking dilated, and we'll talk about the criteria and the echo and the other bits, that is suggested your pretest probability is going to be less. It is less likely to happen. In fact, it's probably going to hurt. Why? Because of that intraventricular interdependence that we talked about, right? That ventricle will start to expand and it'll actually squash that left ventricle more. So you have to be judicious about your, your fluid uh, administration, right? And, and this is really important is because right heart failure can exist with left heart. And yes, we often empirically give fluids, but you have to use the echo and the other parts to recognize that additional fluids might, in the context of right heart, make things worse. Um, so why is this bad, right? As the RV dilates, septum is pushed leftwards in diastole, right? Impaired LV filling and a reduction of cardiac output. Um, people like numbers. So um, if you have this, they say consider, you know, CVP targets of eight to eight to twelve. So keep your CVP low. I that is a very rough rule. Okay, like I mean, there's tons of papers we can talk about. What is the utility of CVP and the other bits and like you know volume compliance curves and stuff like that. But the idea is, if you are starting to see CVPs of this high, again, probably think you know you start thinking it's a problem. But again, that's where right I take into mind what is the echo look and, and we'll talk about that as well but as a number right if you're seeing eight to ten or twelve your heart is your at least your cvp would suggest that your right heart is is full and i mean that in the context of echo mm -hmm. as well um so let's talk about this interventricular septum as well so this is a this is a a, a transesophageal echo which is which is fine okay but the concept here is the septum is flat, okay? You will often hear about this D-shaped septum, okay? And what the important part here is when does that septum appear flat, okay? And if the septum appears flat in diastole, okay, it is RV volume overload, okay? So septum flat in diastole is RV volume overload. Okay. And what happens in RV volume overload is actually when the ventricle pressurizes, when it when it goes to systole, the septum actually bulges back. It actually goes, it actually rounds back out. Okay. We're going to look at these clips a bit more, but I want to have this in mind. So in diastole, if it's flat, okay, RV volume overload. Does that make sense, guys, for the people in the room? Because the most volume that the RV is going to have is a diastole, right? So the volume overload will happen during that phase of the cardiac cycle. And then what happens is in systole, the LV pressurizes, and then so it's able to push the septum back, okay? Which is why. Whereas in RV pressure overload, it is flattened in systole, okay? So basically, it it will be very D-shaped in systole. Mm -hmm. Now, 
these are from the guidelines, okay? Um, and what you wanna see here, okay? And this is RV volume overload on this side, okay? Is the interventricular septum is rounded, okay? At end systole and flat in diastole. Okay, right? So RV volume overload is septal flattening in diastole. This is from my friend Chris Hudson. Oh. <laughs> right, so what I do is I put my finger and or I put my marker in the screen, okay? And I say to myself, systole, 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 okay? Systole. Systole, 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 right? Mm. And as you can see here, as this wall comes in, as we get in towards systole, right? Where's the septum? The septum is flattening in systole. All right, that's the first one. Uh, Nice. How do I move this? Okay. okay. So what happens here? If you look in the middle and you say systole, systole, right? So in systole, what happens? <laughs> the septum goes out, right? The septum moves away, and then in diastole is when it goes flat. Mm. Right, so right here you can see, so it's as in systole, okay? It's round, and there. See in diastole, right? Ventricle is filled and the septum is flat. Okay. Any questions so far? For the purposes of the focus part, uh, you guys can know that it can it can be both. Right. So sometimes it can be flat and consistent diastole, and then so just both just, um, pressure overload as well as well. Yeah, um, they, these conditions do exist in in overlap, um, but generally speaking, if it RV volume overload, right, then you're going to see again this this concept of this eccentricity or this other components, which is basically your your ratios, okay. Which again here is just look, this is normal, right? They're even because the LV is round. Whereas in here, an RV volume load, overload in diastole, this is when the septum gets flattened. Whereas in pressure overload, it's eccentric, right? It's got it's this ovaloid shape throughout the throughout the cycle. So RV volume overload, how do you manage this one? I will say there are things that you can do fast. Um, so I I will set the person up. Okay, I will put their legs down. So put them in a chair position as well. If depending if they're in the OR or otherwise, you can put them in reverse Trendelenburg, okay? To offload, induce venous pooling. Lead the patients, right? Like put it straight into the cell saver or um, even like super syringe, right? No problem. Like just draw off like 50, like 50 mil syringe. Um, higher ventilation pressures as well. Again, and your trade-off here is to reduce venous return, right? Positive pressure ventilation. It's actually a useful technique if you think someone has had too much return. Medium, so nitrates um, as well. So someone who has bad right heart failure, I may run a mix of, of dilators and also vasoconstrictors. Why? Because you're trying to induce venous pooling, right? So preferentially in this case, I use nitroglycerin, right? You know, 50 mics per minute, 
something like that, or potentially higher as well, looking for, to induce venous pooling. Um, again, the slower effect using diuretics and dialysis. I ask myself when I'm doing the echo, how small is the LV? What is my post? Are there actual post capillary problems as well? Um, I will add LV afterload, okay, to stent the ventricle. So this is where things like norepinephrine and vasopressin is, are important here because they don't allow the LV to empty entirely. It's not all just inotropes, okay? Um, I ask myself is if the right ventricle is dilated, right? It may be very far on the Frank Starling position. I may need to add inotropes to help it restore that contractility as well. I think about my RV perfusion pressure, right? Which is aortic diastolic minus your CVP or RV EDP, whichever is or your RV and diastolic pressure, whichever is greater. Um, there's also this concept of as the RV fails, your CVP increases and your left atrial pressure falls. Okay. And this is this is the echo finding suggestive of large right ventricle, small left atrium. Okay. Um, or sorry, left ventricle. And again, this this exists in a lot of the literature as well, like certain kinds of ratios. So normally, right? Normally your your CV, normally your CVP is five and your left atrial pressure is 10, right? That's a general rule. But what happens is as you fail, that reverses. Your left atrial pressure falls. Why? Because the right heart is unable to get fluid through. And then you have more congestion on the right side. Okay. So I look at these ratios as well. Um, whether you use a PA catheter or not, or other techniques as well, or if you use echo to look for this, because these are ominous findings. For pressure overload as well, I ask myself how much cardiac output is enough. I ask myself, is, is this person actually, is there PVR responsiveness as well? So a trial of nitric, a trial of whatever dilator you use <coughs> to see if it helps. I am mindful that you, will, you should ask yourself, is there a post capillary problem? Okay. And that if you unmask this one, can you cause LV failure as well? When I choose my anatomes for RV pressure, right? Milnerone leads to a greater reduction in PVR and LVEDP and the other bits. Why? Because it's a more potent base of dilator. So just have that in, in mind. They are different drugs, which is fine. Um, obviously, the T half, like half life of minutes versus hours, and of course, the renal involvement as well. Um, inhaled nitric oxide is very useful. Again, if you use a PA catheter, then you can use that and then titrate according to PVR and stuff as well. How do you make the decision regarding like the butamine versus melanol and the tachycardic versus the non-tachycardic patient? Excellent. Um, so if you if you have sufficient heart rate, I think then you're then you're pretty good. Uh, DOB is again, it has a greater chronotrope than than melanorone. Melanorone's a more potent vasodilator. So um, and it's a an inotrope again. It, I am also mindful. It depends what other drugs the person has been on. So, for example, if someone's been on beta blockers recently because they normally take them, you know, then I I'd have a lower tendency to add some degree of kind of milder. If they're already tachycardic, then I think that's great because that's probably helping them in terms of their the cardiac output. Exactly. Um, and so I, I would might tend to do milnerone. Some people feel there's less arrhythmias associated with milnerone or those kinds of things as well. But I am mindful that like, yeah, if you give too much milnerone, then you could have vasodilation and hypotension and, uh, and other issues as well. So um, I, I do, I use both drugs though. So because they have different effects. Um, and if someone's really sick, just use epinephrine is my personal bias. I'm an epi fan. Um, and vasopressin as well. Yeah. Um, I will say this, I'm, I didn't include a lot of trials, but this one was really, this is an interesting one because I just, it was mainly to challenge the way people think about this, right? So the idea is that if you give sildenafil you, to help people with pulmonary hypertension after corrected valve disease, your people are like, this is good, right? Like I'm fixing pulmonary hypertension. Of course, this must be good. Well, it turns out that's not actually the case, right? you actually have more clinical like adverse events and people actually get sicker with sildenafil. Why? Because what happens is you actually end up flooding the left side, okay? So I am mindful that if you see something, you still have to decide, is this something I need to fix it? Which is why it's kind of like, don't let perfection get away in the way of success. So 
if someone's doing okay and the left and the right heart is looking bad, but it's not perfect, but the person's doing all right, like, is that enough? It might be. Um, intentionally starting people on dilators can have side effects, which in this case here, right, right, which is, it's different. Acute, acute physiological changes clearly have different long-term physiological impacts. So just because you made the PA pressures better, that doesn't actually mean you made the patient better. Because in this case, it was pretty clear, right, that they're much more likely to be hospitalized. And it's interesting, if you look at their echo findings when they did the study, the left ventricles all became much larger and became overloaded. So. Uh, you're just talking about no renown. Yeah. Watching and, you know, getting lots for half life. Yeah, so. totally. So if you're on dialysis, right, the maximum you should do is like 0.25, which is equivalent of like, you know, ridiculous amounts of mills. So yes, yeah, so it definitely can creep in there. Um, <coughs> for sure. Um, so yeah, so this was just in a study. So I, I am mindful that if you are starting people on drugs, um, that you don't precipitate a problem, you know, that might, that you might not need it to have done. So then we get to the echo um, a little bit. There's obviously guidelines as well. So there's the dedicated right heart guidelines from 2010. And then of course the chamber quantifications, which also talk about the right heart from 2015. Um, I will say that there's no just one view, which I think is really important as well. And that these techniques, I will talk about them. Um, you'll see that some are more common than others, but the idea here is just to intro them. When you are doing the right heart, most of the time, people should do an apical RV focus, okay? So what that means is you can see here. So normally you're aiming, right? Okay, you're aiming for that intraventricular septum to be in the midline, okay? Separating the two. But in this case, what we are doing is we are looking at the right side more. So you got this intraventricular septum kind of on this lazy slant, okay? This is what we're doing, the RV focus apical four. We are not doing this one. We are not doing the R RV modified, right? Which is, again, see how the apex is off. We are actually, you're trying to keep that apex in position, okay? And now you're looking at the right heart. This is what we're trying to do. This concept here is really important. You want to make sure that you cut the right ventricle. And this, so this is the angle with which that you are turning your probe, okay? If you cut, if you, if you cut it, the right ventricle will look really small, like on angle three here versus number one. So this is when you're pointing the probe, you wanna make sure you're catching the axis and you're twisting the probe appropriately to find the maximal dimensions, okay? This is really important, okay? This is how, again, you can change your diameters, right? Four or five millimeters, big difference, okay? And again, right? The lines of intersection are really important in terms of how you're doing this, depending on your size. Okay. And this, this is where you can under call something. So if you, so you really want to make it as large as you can, essentially, when you're doing this. This is how you measure RV thickness. Okay. You ideally you do it in a, when your imaging plane is perpendicular. So you do subcostal. Okay. Subcostal, and you want to use M mode here to do your thickness. And why is this important? Because again, you're going to do acute versus chronic. This is a, a very important basic echo tool, but I just I can't say how the number of people who like don't know this. So I so I think EKG gating is really important. Okay. But and it's important because it tells you when you're looking at something. And so you want to know. So ventricular systole is from the peak of, you know, right, from the R here, okay, to the end of the T wave. This is important because you want to know, well, it, when should I, when do you measure wall thickness, right? So you measure in diastole, okay, right? So how do you know that? Well, because you've looked at your EKG data, right? And if you want to, again, when am I going to measure my ventricle in, in diastole for my EFs and other bits? I'm going to measure it right before 
that R wave. Okay, and then I'm going to measure it at the end of that T wave. Okay, it helps, it gives me an extra, an extra way to know my timing. So, right, TRS complex is the end of the T wave. Okay, not the beginning, right there. I know it sounds basic, but like, it's actually really important. Because you're going to ask yourself later, and this is not just for this one, but later on, you're like, where's that jet? What's the timing? And this stuff is so important. Is it in systole or is it in diastole, right? Is it a shunt or is it not? Restricted or not? Well, your timing and when it happens in the cycle is actually really important. Um, this is just one of the documents and I put it here mainly because it has everything that's abnormal, which I think is really good. I'll send it around and you guys can look at it. I've just put it here because it, it has everything that's really useful. Same thing in this one, okay? Which is like, when when do when are things bad or otherwise? And again, because I, I think this is really just practice and memorization, I'll be honest. <clears throat> um, what are some basic things that we can do? So for measurement here again, what do we do? So this is the RV internal diameter. And so some people will say tricuspid annulus. Yes, you can do that. The other option is really you measure it at the base, at the base, okay? The widest portion of the base, which is usually in association with the tricuspid annulus, okay? Um, and it's 41, essentially. And then there's mid, okay, which is at the mid papillary version, right? Like here's the mid papillaries on the left side. And that is 35. As an overall rule, this area should be less than two thirds of your left ventricle, right? But 41 and 35 are probably are, are pretty reasonable for making a diagnosis of dilation. Um, and again, so it's here again, maximal transverse dimension at the basal third of the RV inflow and diastole in the RV focused view, right? So you're looking at the RV as well. Um, we'll talk briefly about TAPSI and also tissue Doppler. So TAPSI again, right? I'm sure everyone people are familiar. M mode as well. Look at your EKG gating, right? So here it is. There's your point of maximal movement, right? So at the beginning here, right? QRS complex all the way and to the height here right, which would be your maximum just at the end of your T wave, okay? Caveats with TAPSI again are that you are, um, TAPSI again is you're trying to, you're trying to take a single dimension measurement, which is the movement of one annual, one portion and then to extrapolate a 3D ejection fraction. I will say also, I don't know what everyone's criteria is for mild, moderate or severe, right? Um, and it, and it, it's one of those great systems or questions of like, if you have a TAPSI of 1.3, is that the same as a, a decrease from 1.3 to 1.1? Is it is a linear system? It, it's not, right? I, I think, and that's the important part is, so yes, less than 1.7 is abnormal, but is it a linear change after that or, or the other parts? It's not. And so I think it, a, a cutoff is probably appropriate to say, yes, there's there's some degree of ab abnormality. When you write the echo board, just know the 1.6 cutoff and that's it. You can't use it like if it's 0.9, that's really severe or mild and moderate. Yeah. Like there's there's no guidelines on that. So. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's kind of where people make that mistake. Oh, it's like 1.2 is really bad. I was like, well, no, it's just, it's just bad. Yeah, it's bad. Um, it's binary. Um, so this is the one that I, I might put my hat on a little bit more about. I would say this, fractional area change okay so you're taking a two-dimensional area and you're extrapolating that to represent three and again and why is it better because it has a better relationship to actual ef by a cardiac mr and that's where something i'd like we could find like if you actually wanted to do ef or something here um the again the guidelines say 35 is your cutoff um which i think is fine as a number if you want to know um, and then other guidelines will say you can use seven percent as your major as your degradation. So I, I that's what I do. I, I do thirty five as normal, and then seven percent from there thereafter. So, like mild reduction, right, is like is anything less from thirty five to then like twenty eight. Yeah. 
right? Moderate is less than 21 and severe is anything less than like kind of 20%, okay? So if I do fat, that's how I do it. Um, again, right? You're tracing your end diastolic area. You do not, right? Okay, so it's all these other things like moderator bands and everything, they're all included. You do not exclude them. That's the important part, right? See, like here, you're just tracing that out one as well. Okay. okay. Um, this is another, another one. So this is the left ventricle, okay? But it's called DP by T, DT, which is the rate of change. So basically, you look at, the, at their TR jet and then you measure basically the time it takes to increase from velocity from either what, from the one meter per second to the three, to the two or three. And it basically gives you amount of pressure. This is the isovolemic like contraction talk, like basic contraction. Um, so the right ventricle is pressurizing. Um, to give you an example, a, nor a normal like left ventricle is like 1200 or, or more, okay? Whereas on the right heart, it, they say you can use 400 as a cutoff, okay? Why is this important? Because you might not be able to get other measurements, but if you could get this one, it would be it would be something to look at. I will say there's low dependency as well. So again, whether the person's quality have it or not. Um, is this something that's done routinely? No, but it's in the guidelines. So I think it's important to talk about it. Um, this is mainly just as a point here. Um, so the other one is how do you trace these things as well? People, I don't know if you guys ever talked about the, the chin and the beard. Those. Yeah. So the question is like, where do you cut off things? Do you do it where like it's starting to be a little bit fuzzy, or will you actually go where like the line is clear? Always go where the line is clear. Okay. Do not try and make it worse by going to the fuzzy areas. Because you'll overestimate it. Yeah. Guys. Um. <clears throat> this is this is a, another view. So this is your right. This is your RV inflow outflow. Okay. Right. Aortic valve short axis view pulmonary artery here. And this one is for your pulmonary artery acceleration time. Okay. So pulmonary artery ex extension. <coughs> sorry. Pulmonary, pulmonary ex acceleration time essentially is as your pulmonary hypertension gets worse, the time gets shorter. Okay. And that's a and that's a function of RV contractility and R and pulmonary vascular resistance. Normally the pulmonary vascular resistance is like a low pressure system. So it doesn't peak very early, right? It's just like a very gentle bag, you know, but if you have problems with pulmonary hypertension, like very stiff, right? What happens? Very rapid increase in blood pressure. Okay. So that's the physiological mechanism and, and it changes your waveform. Normally you get this nice widened kind of one here, but then as you get sicker, you get this very rapid rise. Uh, in, in pressure. So normal here is like, okay, 130, like 120, people will say. If you get under 100, it definitely looks weird. Uh, definitely 80 would be awkward. And then 60 is for sure, like, you know, definitely something's wrong. I will say the caveat on this one is you need, there be, can be some variations, especially if you have a very failing right heart, because it just can't generate the pressures and stuff as well. It's the same but, thing when like you're trying to do uh, RVST measurement guys on your TR, and sometimes your TR doesn't tell you the full story, the pulmonary uh, PVA team will tell the story a bit more. Um, okay. So then here's the RVSP. Um, Brian's got a great one about RVSP. So I'm, I'm not really going to be, belabor it. I'm just going to give you my editorial, which is I'm kind of, it's okay. Um, and then I'll also give you my same editorial about, about IVC, which is it's okay. Um, so basically, I think you have to, Yes, RVSP can be very good if it's good. Um, and here's why, okay? So RVSP, RVSP is about getting this regurgitin jet, okay? And it's a gradient between two chambers, the right ventricle and the right atrium. In order to know someone's RVSP, you must add the pressure of the receiving chamber, okay? This doesn't matter for RVSP or even left-sided pressures, actually. It's the same thing. You need to, when you when you measure a gradient like a BSD or something, you actually need to know the pressure of the receiving chamber. It's actually important. And so the problem here is you can have a whole bunch of errors because you either you couldn't measure the jet properly, because you couldn't get proper alignment, or because you didn't even know what the CVP is. Okay. And so here's the thing: the guidelines all talk about this like measure IVC to approximate different kinds of things, right? Yes, 
if your diameter is with a certain one and there's a certain percentage of collapsibility, blah, blah, blah. And this is from, Bri from Brian, right? Which is spontaneous, which again, in us is totally different, right? We have mixed mode ventilation, we have positive pressure ventilation, deep sedation versus not, all these other wonky things. And so the honest thing is, RVSP can be problematic because you cannot rely on the other things that people are doing to calculate the pressure in the receiving chamber, okay? Um, and this, this is basically a, a bland Altman looking at the difference between the diagnostic echo and people who got a right heart cath, okay? And what you can see here is if you were in the normal pressure, right? So, okay, so the average measurement here was 40, you're actually kind of concordant. You're like, this is actually okay. But what you can see here is as the pressure increases, it starts to go all over the place, okay? Echo becomes less accurate or there's, there's more discordance, okay? And why is that? Well, because here some of it is because of this right heart measurement as well, right? So, you know, ideally if it was perfect, Echo says it's CVP is 15 or whatever it is, everyone would be clustered around here. Well, it turns out it's all over, right? And so that adds inaccuracy to your measurements as well. So I am mindful that yes, uh, RBSP has a role. It is very, it is very useful, but you should also understand the caveats in your technique. And the easiest part for me is make sure you have a good envelope, good alignment, and then just use the CVP. It's another reason to transduce it. I don't think it. That's bad. If they have an upper arm or upper limb, yes, yeah. yeah, just get that. Like looking at you see. You know, as um, Warren mentioned, can be fraught with error. So, yeah. um, there we are. We are one hour in. <laughs>